there was a controversy a year ago where a woman came forward and said that you were pushy with her. You respected the no, you got the consent, but you were pushy about it. Mm. Looking back, can you tell the story of that? What are the lessons you learned from it? Yeah, I mean, I've yet to speak on this for a lot of reasons, mostly because it's just, a, it was a hard time and it's a sensitive subject and I've wanted to prioritize the reporting, but I think that now I'm uh, ready and able to do so. Everything sort of started on um, December 30th, 2022, and that was the release date of the HBO project. Like I told you, we didn't know when the movie was gonna come out. We weren't told that it was gonna come out on that date until early November. And so it was like, oh my God, here we go. We had a movie coming out. HBO had, I didn't even know it was gonna be them. So every day for those <laughs> 50 days to where I received word and to the movie announcement or to the movie release was like, I was like a kid waiting for Christmas morning. You know what I mean? It, it was like every day I just, I saw the movie release date as the first day of like the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And so I remember the week of the movie release, it was like every day I was like, oh my God, six days, five days, four days. And when it became two days, like I was so excited. And so like, honestly, anxiety riddled because it was such a massive platform that I went out to the desert by myself out in the Mojave, got a hotel and just kind of sat there. And then movie release day comes, it was supposed to come out at um, 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. I remember it was like 12 hours left, 10 hours left. And then eight minutes before the movie at 7.52, or I guess it was sent at 10.52 East Coast time, I got a text message uh, requesting a portion of my fat HBO check to contribute toward apparently years of therapy bills that this person had accrued after she says that she felt that I pressured her into giving consent years prior. And I was confused. Not, not only because of the timing, but because this is someone that I hadn't seen in years or spoken to in years. And I presume that I was on good terms with. Um, so I didn't respond to the text message. And then when I didn't respond, about seven days later, this person made some TikTok videos and with the help of some friends, launched an online campaign that got picked up by the press pretty quickly. So what did you feel like when you got that text? Well, it's tough because on one hand, I'm not opposed to restitution being part of a private accountability process for real abuse. You know, like if you've hurt someone to an extent that it took them out of work or something, like I think they're entitled to some money. But unfortunately, as I later learned, this person had legal counsel and this was an attempt to basically create evidence by extracting a confession from me to use as precedent for a civil lawsuit to the tune of a couple million dollars. It's dark. Yeah. How did you meet this person? Well, I met them when I was 22. And I, like I told you, I was living in an RV, making this show called All Gas, No Breaks. And I would travel between cities like every other day. And so I would basically pick a new city. And I got in this like pretty bad habit of what I would say is essentially treating Instagram like a, like a dating app. You know, I would go to a new place. I'd post my location. I'd surf the DMs and I would look for like fans to meet up with. It wasn't always girls. It was just people to party with because I was also partying every night, but a lot of times ended up being girls and stuff. And so that's kind of how this situation was. Um, I didn't have sex with this person. Um, had a consensual encounter that they reached out to me about two weeks after saying, hey, I don't want you to take this the wrong way. But looking back, I felt a lot more pressure to agree than I realized in the moment. I don't think this is any fault of yours. I just think that you came on a bit too strong and I didn't want to let you down. So I gave in and it was that language made me feel horrible, mainly because if this person had told me, Hey, I don't want to hook up. I would have said, yeah, of course not. Why would I don't want to hook up with someone who doesn't want to hook up with me. And I think that as fame increased during that time, I think I was just kind of oblivious to how people were seeing me, especially those who had a digital relationship with me prior to me knowing them. And I don't think that I handled that the right way. Well, thank you for taking accountability. But just to clarify, you got consent. Yeah, I was the initiatory party in an interaction with uh, a fan who felt that she had to say yes because of, I'm, I'm not sure why, I don't know why, but like I said, this person also disclosed to me they had a history of childhood trauma. 
and were actively being treated for PTSD and that they felt things moved too fast for them given their situation. And so I, I told her, I said, hey, if you want to reach out, if you want to talk on the phone, I'm always here for you. I'm sorry to hear that. Let me know if we can talk further. Um, about six months after that, um, I was at Sturgis Bike Week. And uh, I remember this day, this was the hardest day. I was just chilling and I got a text from my friend and it said, hey man, you're getting canceled right now. And I was like, what do you mean? Like, did someone find an old tweet or something? What are you talking about? And I opened my phone and it was this Instagram story of me. It was like the ugliest picture of me you can find. It was like my face open. It was like screenshotted. Um, and it said, I remember this specifically because I just couldn't believe it. It said, the ugly loser who hosts all gas, no breaks is a piece of shit. He knowingly abused my friend and got away with it. If you follow him, I'm going to message you and ask you why. So this person who I don't know, I didn't even know where who the accusation was coming from. They text, they emailed every production company that I was working with, DM'd hundreds, if not thousands of people, like just saying that like I was this piece of shit. And I didn't even know who this person was. So I was frantically calling and texting like every person that I'd seen intimately for the past year and being like, hey, are we on good terms? Is everything okay? And then I figured out that the person was coming from Florida and I knew who it was. And so thankfully I reached out to the original um, person who I had the communication with. And um, I said, hey, like, I think this might've been you. This might've been your friend who posted this. Are we good? Like, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I apologized again. I was like, listen, I feel bad that you feel this way. I, I wanna do anything that I can to help you. Again, I apologize. And um, she said, apology accepted, I'm sorry. My friend asked if I could, if she could post on my behalf. And I'm sorry, I was going through a lot mentally and I saw your fame increasing. And so I agreed to let her speak on my behalf. And um, we let, we made amends in private. You know, I said, okay, I'm here for you. Let me know. And she said, apologies enough. Thank you for taking the time to speak with me. And that was two years prior to this text message being sent to my phone eight minutes before the movie. So naturally, I wanted to go on my platforms and talk about what was happening. But I, but I also didn't want to mess up the rollout of the movie, you know. And uh, so the the PR firm was like, we got this. We'll handle this for you. And that was, I guess, by way of a TMZ thing that said, Andrew Callahan is devastated. I'm not sure why they thought that that was going to make people be in my favor, but yeah. you know, it was just a picture of me on NBC that said, Andrew Callahan devastated by allegations that that was their plan, I guess, to show that I was remorseful or something, you know. How much of this do you think lawyers kind of pushing this when money and fame are involved? Well... I wish I could say the lawyer, but I, I just can't um, that was involved in this. But I will tell you that I try to lean away from resentment and toward accountability completely. What was my role in the situation? How can I never make someone feel like that again? What can I do? What changes can I make to make sure that one, I never treat someone this way and two, to never be in that position again? Well, Again, thank you for taking accountability. And the main reason I talk about that is because it wasn't just that person. There was multiple people who made videos reporting similar behavior. And so it's obvious that that was a pattern of behavior of mine. And so I made the apology video to announce that I was taking some time away because I just needed time away. I mean, my entire support system collapsed. My friends at the time disappeared. I was getting like obituaries texted to my phone that were like, hey, it's been nice knowing you. It's, it was great to see you grow. Good luck, you know, like I was dead. And uh, yeah, it got dropped from my agency. No one gave me tough love. No one called me to ask me if I was all right. It was just only, everyone disappeared in a week. Again, thank you for taking accountability, but I just hate how many cowards there are out there. Like when yeah. people hit low points is when when you should help, when you should stand with them if you know the, their character. Yeah, and it was just, um, it was hard to separate like the initial situation that I knew was more or less a setup and the possibly genuine other accounts. And so it was like, all right, you know what? At this point in my life, I wanna be on the right side of history. I don't wanna be the anti-cancel culture mouthpiece I don't have the, the mental strength to fight this, especially because I was envisioning 
the HBO drop to be this like the world opens up to me moment and it was just the reverse. But the uh, it wasn't so much the the media reporting on it that hurt me. It was just little stuff like a, a childhood friend that you love seeing they unfollowed you on Instagram or just like seeing someone on the street that you grew up with and like waving at them and they don't, they don't do anything back. And, and you're just like, Oh my God, man, like this is my new life. But what are you supposed to do? Thankfully, I like somehow two weeks after I met an amazing partner who I'm still with to this day. And I was able to conquer my two biggest fears, which is monogamy and dogs. I was terrified of dogs and terrified of having a girlfriend. Now I have a girlfriend who I love and two dogs. So what were the, what was the lowest point? Well, right after this happened, I entered like a recovery programs. Started with AA, but then I found a more specialized program that dealt with the issues that I was dealing with. Say the hardest point was um, logically deducing that the lives of my loved ones would be better off if I was gone. You know what I mean? And uh, thinking that my, my my mom and my friends, that their life would be better if I took myself out of the picture. And um, for one, I just figured, you know, their friends canceled. You know, her son is a disgrace. You know, my, my family's going to think they raised me wrong. And my friends, I'm a social pariah now. I'm a burden. I'm better off dead. And uh, the hard part was, you know, I would read um, stories and books written by parents who lost their kids to suicide. And they reported feeling a lot of anger after the suicide. So I tried to think of what's the way I can do it to get the least amount of anger on behalf of the people who would grieve. Because hanging someone will discover you. So I figured that drinking myself to death would be the way to do it. And uh, I wasn't able to. Yeah, that was just a dark place. You know, I remember hating the people who loved me because... <sighs> I knew they would grieve and that made me mad. That makes sense. Like I was ready to go. I had no will to live, but their grief was like, I didn't want to cause that. I didn't want to hurt them. So I was like, I hated the people who loved me because they were stopping me from taking my own life. You know, and uh, it's weird to think that like when I was going through that, if you walk by me in the street, I look like a normal guy. And so now when I walk around and I see people, I think to myself, you have no idea what that person is going through. You know, like it's crazy that so many people are suffering in like complete silence and you can't, they don't wear it on them. You know? Many of the people you talk to are probably that. Yeah. Many people you've interviewed before all this and after are probably going through some shit. And I also thought if, if I could write down what I just told you on a piece of paper and I was to, to do it and then they found the note, they would take it more seriously because they would know that I wasn't lying. Yeah. But then, you know, if you do it, it reduces the lifespan of your parents by 15 years. So I looked at it like I was taking time away from them. Well, thank you for the most part leaning towards accountability. It's the right path to take. Uh, what advice would you give to young men uh, that look up to you on how they can be good men, especially you, in regard to women? If you have any kind of platform, you know, whether it doesn't have to be famous on Instagram, it could be like if you're a pillar of your community in the culinary world or whatever it is, um, just be hyper aware of that and remember that you are inheriting a power dynamic that can create situations where there might be some pressure that you you don't even realize is there, but it's definitely there. And you just have to be aware of that. And two, um, when when meeting new partners, having hookups and stuff like that, just try to have a trauma-informed conversation about their past. Really know the experiences and the backstory of what a new partner has gone through in that world of intimacy whatever they're comfortable, uh, uh, you know, to share, obviously. But, you know, I would advise against one night stands. I would advise against hooking up with someone um, that you're meeting for the first time. Have those conversations prior 
because even though it might sound like a vibe killer, it's not. And if you think that that conversation is a vibe killer, you probably shouldn't be in that situation in the first place. Especially now, how hypersexualized things are and how common that type of violence is, you need to be able to have those conversations and stop and say, hey, tell me a little bit about your past. Is there any triggers to make you uncomfortable? Let me know how I can be the best partner to you. And I'm sure that college age people are not having those conversations, but I'm sure that it would go a long way. So especially when you're young, college aged, you don't have enough experience to be able to read a person without having that conversation. Because a lot of times you can see the trauma without explicitly talking about it. Yeah. But that takes experience and knowledge and seeing the world. When you're young and you don't know, you really don't know shit, making things a bit more explicit is probably better. Yeah, and also like, as men we're trained to believe that it's our duty to be the initiatory party in any type of like sexual encounter. Like, oh, like man chases woman. You know what I mean? Like, you know, you have to be the one to make the move and or like she's playing hard to get if, you know, she's resistant to your first like compliment or something. I think that that's not always how it has to be and that extra caution needs to be placed if you're taking the initiatory role in an interaction, especially if someone has a traumatic background. They might agree to do something with you because they're scared and you might not realize that's what's going on. But because you don't, you don't see yourself as a predatory person, you don't see yourself as someone who would ever consciously make someone un uncomfortable or cross a boundary, but people have histories that you might not understand. And for me, as someone who doesn't have much honestly, like childhood trauma or anything like that. It's been an interesting year for me working in therapy and elsewhere, understanding how that affects the mind. And also I understand that hurt people hurt people. And that someone with a traumatic background isn't going to have sympathy for applying that traumatic pain to someone else, even if that person isn't the cause of, of, of what put them in that spot. 